Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 19th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the governor's second veto budget. What's in it and where do we go from here? Second, a live lesson in hypocrisy. Many of those legislators who are pushing to maintain government spending are voting to avoid paying for it themselves. And third, what a progressive income tax would mean to Alaskans. It's not pretty. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get cracking on this. The weekly top three. We got to talk about it. Of course, the big issue is the question of the second round of vetoes. And uh, where do we go from here? And what are we going to, uh, you know, what are we going to experience? And what does it all mean uh, from Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets? Well, I think that I think there's two top lines for 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 me, uh, Michael. The first top line is the governor's decision to accept the partial PFD, um, mm-hmm. indicate that he's going to continue to work for the remainder of the PFD, but to accept the sixteen hundred dollars. You and I had a long discussion about this on last week's show. We were on opposite sides of it. I'm pleased to see the governor accept the partial PFD. I, I I'm not sure where we were going to go if he would have vetoed it vetoed it, uh, but but at a minimum, we weren't going to have uh, a timely contribution, any contribution from the PFD into the Alaska economy um, in October. So uh, it's not the full PFD, and I recognize that that's, that's an issue that we continue to fight. It's an issue we fought the last three years, but $1,600 is, is a pretty good kick um, into the pockets of Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy. And, and I, for one, am certainly pleased to see the governor uh, sort of choose the, the, the best of the worst, um, uh, accepting the, the PFD, accepting the $1,600 or, right. or, or vetoing the, the $1,600. Well, and, and I think you and I, you know, we may have been on opposite sides, and I think more from my standpoint, from a visceral standpoint, I understand totally that this was a no-win scenario for the governor. I mean, he was damned if you do, damned if you don't, for sure. Um, because he was going to alienate somebody one way or the other. And, and I understand that. Uh, I may have made a different decision, but again, that's why I'm not the governor. So sorry about that. Well, it's about, it's about a billion dollars into the Alaska economy before, before the, uh, uh, the, the trickle down factor. And, um, uh, and I, and I think that's, that's an important decision to bring that money into the, into the Alaska economy. And I, and I congratulate him for, for making it or I, 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 I think he did the right thing for making that decision. The other top line, though, is, is not as good, um, and, and that is sort of the state of the budget after the smoke clears uh, from the fires and everything else. But the state of the budget as as we stand now, um, we start we have about three point three billion dollars in revenues uh, after a full PFD, um, and 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 that's 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 what our revenues are. Uh, unless we tax uh, the PFD by cutting the PFD, or, or or have other taxes, or or draw from savings as we've done the past uh, past eight years, um, so about 3.3 billion dollars is our starting point. Uh, the governor's initial budget, uh, way the heck back at the beginning, was was beneath that, uh, about 30 million dollars beneath that. It was 3.268 billion dollars after you took into account the new revenue that he was proposing by by upstreaming uh, property taxes from from the boroughs, oil property taxes from the boroughs. Um, where we've landed uh, is not anywhere near as good. So keep in mind, we have $3.3 billion in revenue after a full PFD. 
even after the second vetoes, uh, spending is now at about $4.2 billion. So we're $900 million in the red. Yet again, another year, the, the, the ninth year in a row uh, that, that, that we're putting out a budget uh, that's going to be in the red, expecting to end a year uh, in the red. That's down from from where uh, the House or the the legislature had put us uh, with uh, House Bill 2001 and Senate Bill 2002. Their effort to restore funding from the first vetoes, it's down from that. That was about 4.3 billion dollars, uh, but 4.2 billion dollars is still 900 million dollars uh, more uh, than than our revenues. Right. And 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 I you know. This governor's made an effort. Uh, the, as I said, his initial budget was was right at uh, the the revenue level, uh, and and he's and and the legislature has pushed back mildly, and the governor's pushed back on that. Uh, the legislature at one point uh, was at uh, four point five billion dollars uh, uh, after the Senate had had acted, and we're down to four point two, but. But still, we're nine hundred million dollars in the hole, and and we need we, we need to wake up to that. We need to we need to focus on the fact that even after this this huge effort and this and and this huge pushback, and even after the governor's second round of vetoes, we're still nine hundred million dollars in deficit. And, right, and that's that's a number we've got to we've got to start dealing with. Well, and I think that uh, I mean I will give the governor credit where credit's due. I mean, I don't think we would be anywhere near this number if he had not started with the shock effect of that February budget at 3.2 billion dollars. I I just don't think that we would even be anywhere near that based on past legislative actions and everything else where they actually like increased the budget last year. They're in a they're in a fairyland. They're in a la la land of Oh, it's not a big deal. I just I stumbled across that image of Gary Knopp telling one of his constituents uh, how, you know, that he was simply amazed and dumbfounded as to how you could possibly think that we're in some type of financial crisis. Uh, I mean, they just believe that it's all, uh, you know, ponies and rainbows and it's all going to be fine. They just have to spend enough to make the economy tick. And so I will give the governor credit for at least jump starting that conversation. We didn't get where we wanted to go. But like you said, at least it's better than the alternative. It is, and 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 you're exactly right. I mean, the adjusted base budget. We all we can remember back to that. That's what the legislature sort of used as their starting point. Uh, was 4.7 billion dollars, which would have been you know 1.4 billion dollars in the hole. That's that's really where the legislature started. Uh, the, the legislature's starting point was, and and we have to give credit to the governor to for, to getting that 4.7 uh, down to 4.2. Uh, the legislature wants to take some of that credit uh, of its own for making cuts, but I think you're right. If the governor hadn't been been out there leading that effort, we wouldn't have gotten that half billion dollars. But but just think of all the effort we've gone through to get that half billion dollars from from the from the adjusted base starting point, and we're still nine hundred million dollars right um, in the hole. Right, and it's just I mean it, it's 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 it, it, it to to think that we're going to close that through additional cuts to think that that 900 million dollars is going to be closed through additional cuts cuts is just is just not it's not rational thinking and we need to start confronting as as you and I have talked about on this show for a long time uh, we need to confront the fact that that we don't have the revenues to match the spending and and when you talk about spending i mean you, you look at I'm a little dumbfounded by a couple of these of these of these uh, 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 restored spending that the governor accepted didn't veto. Right. I mean, the, uni- the university is problematic. Uh, I think he I think not not standing on his vetoes on the university is a problem. Um, and then, you know, to restore funding to the arts. Now, I've got a lot of friends in the arts and and. And and they are very mad at me for saying that you know I wouldn't work to 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 restore funding on the arts. But you know when we're cutting Medicaid, when we're cutting the ferries, when we're cutting uh, a, a, a number of things, and we're restoring funding to the arts council. Um, I, I mean I, I think I think we've I think we're, we're sort of seeing the bottom of how many cuts we can make when the pushback when the governor's getting so much pushback that he's restoring things to, to like restoring funding to the arts council. So that $900 million, it, I think is a, is a, is a very real, very serious deficit number 
that we need to address. We've gone nine years without without having a balanced budget. We've gone nine years from where we've drawn from savings or the last three where we've where we've made PFD cuts. We've used PFD taxes to to help close the deficit. This year we're we're drawing from the CBR, we're drawing from the SBR, and we're making P, PFD cuts. The legislature proposes to make PFD cuts again. We we we've got a revenue problem. And 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 we need to come to grips with that and continue the conversation that you and I have had and others have had about about how we're going to deal with that revenue problem. The governor seemed to address that in his uh, public announcement, uh, which I thought was kind of unique, that he bypassed all the public media and went straight to the people with it, which I thought was a good move on his part, uh, by basically reiterating time and time and time again that, that we can't continue. We just cannot continue to do what we're doing, and this is a step one of a multi-step approach to do that. Um, but the problem is, is that he's not operating in a vacuum. I mean, he's got to have, and the legislature is just not interested in the reality of there's not enough money. And I think they're driving us to this point of saying, we're going to have to do something, uh, in the form of taxation. Well, and the, and the, and the legislature has been doing taxation. I mean, that's what PFD cuts are. There are targeted income tax, targeted tax on PFD income. Um, it's the worst possible way to raise new revenue. It has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. It is by far the costliest to Alaska families. It is it 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 saves the top 20 percent it at the burden of um, of shoving costs off on the remaining 80 percent. It's a horrible way to raise revenues, but but that's that's what the legislature's been doing. So I think that I I think it's time for the governor, uh frankly, and this is the message that 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 I will send to him. I think it's time for the governor to 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 think about new revenues and to think about what the fairest way is to raise new revenues. You know, if he if he comes out in favor of a flat tax, if he if he says, look, our choice is either to cut the budget more or to have a or, or to have a tax, uh, a fair tax to 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 cover to to to, to deal with the, the the deficit. Frankly, I think people start waking up and going, oh, wait, crap, I'm going to have to pay a tax. Wait a second. I want this. I want more cutting. I think. I think we get. I think we get more people awake to the fact of the need for cuts. But 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 until we have that, until we put that on the table, until we say we are going to balance this budget, we're either going to balance it through new revenue or we're going to balance it through additional cuts. Um, until until he puts that word revenue on the table, um, uh, we're we're not going to get at this nine years, sixteen billion dollars in blown savings into it we're not going to get this solved un until we face up to where we are well and i think that's uh, that's the high ground that we've tried to take on the conservative side is that we won't mention any cuts or we won't mention any revenues or taxation but i think at this point it's what it's going to take to like you say move the needle back into the court of wait you mean you're going to tax us because we spend too much okay cut more and i think that's that's what it's going to take in the long run um this really was for the governor uh, I keep using the analogy of the Star Trek, uh, you know, Kobayashi Maru no win scenario. It really was just there was no pleasing anybody with this solution uh, because you know if he if he vetoed the whole thing, he puts a billion dollar plug into the Alaska economy uh, by by not vetoing it. He's I mean we got somebody in the chat room, Gary in the chat room just said I'm so mad about it I went ahead and signed the recall, which you know. <laughs> Which I don't. I mean, I don't even know what to say to that because that that seems to be counterintuitive to me. But there are people in his base that are feeling that way. That it's just flat out betrayal. Uh, your thoughts? Well, it's not. It's not betrayal by the governor. I mean, the Supreme Court said the Supreme Court said that the legislature has to appropriate, giving the legislature the ability, and 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 that the, not only the legis legislature has to appropriate, but they don't have to follow the statute. So giving the, the legislature the free shot at um, uh, at cutting the PFD. And when you look at the legislature, 80% of them are in the top 10 or top 20%. 80% of the legislature is in the top 20%. So you get you get this situation where the legislature says, we want to spend more. We've got, we've got constituents uh, and, and special interests that are pushing us to spend more. We want to spend more. Uh, and, and geez, we found a way where where we can spend more and and us 
uh, as, a, as, as legislators and our backers, our donors, who are also in the top 20%, we found a way where they don't have to pay. So we can look like good guys um, out here uh, uh, spending, but, but we don't have to pay for it. We can push it off on, on somebody else. Right. Um, and so the legislature, which, which has to appropriate the PFD, says, yeah, we're going to tax it by you know, $1,300 or, or $1,400. Cut it down to sixteen hundred dollars. We're gonna, you know, use the rest of the money to fund all this spending. We don't have to. It's not gonna affect us. Um, and and that's what the governor's got to deal with. So, the, we we the governor was facing the situation was facing a situation where if he vetoed the PFD, there was no well certainly we weren't gonna have a timely PFD uh, in October. It was gonna be zero. Um, and there was no guarantee what kind of PFD we were going to end up even later in the year or if this drug on into next year. Uh, this, this is where the old adage, bird in the hands, worth a, you know, more, more than a bird in the bush or however that goes. Um, and, and he had $1,600. He had a billion dollars into the Alaska, the pockets of Alaskans and the Alaska economy in hand. He, there was a huge uncertainty about what was going to happen if he, if he said no thanks. Um, and I and I and I really, I mean, I commend the governor on making that on making the right decision. Hard choice, yes. A lot of people who, you know, push back and said, "Oh no, don't do," you know, if we can't have it all, we don't want anything. But this is real money. This is this is a real world decision. And the governor was facing, you know, either putting a billion dollars into the hands of Alaskans or putting zero into the hands of Alaskans. And I think he made the right choice. Catherine says something which I think pretty much distills the essence of what we've been talking about. She says, this will be our reality until we restructure the legislature. And I think that's really the final puzzle piece on this thing. If we had had a legislature that was supportive of the governor, if we'd had a majority that was supportive of the governor, even just on the House side, and we know the Senate's been fighting back as much as anybody else, but at least we could probably could have gotten further on down the road here, and we may not have to be talking about taxation and other things. That restructuring of the legislature really is job number one come this next year. Are we are, are we wrong? No, I think it's important. But Michael, here, I mean, even the Republican minority caved on some of these. When you look at the at the items that he accepted. Um, uh, rather than vetoed the second time, the items that made it through the second time, what really happened was they counted noses on whether they had 16 to support uh, 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 a veto on those subjects. And and what we see from from those that didn't get vetoed are are, are areas where he didn't have 16, which means he was losing a, a chunk, not all probably, uh, but a chunk of that Republican minority on those items. Right. So they're, they're really, I mean, even on the Republican side, there is, there is a line, you know, you, you, you hear Shelley talk about, or, and, and Laura talk about, and Colleen talk about uh, senior benefits, how important it is to retain senior benefits. There must've been somebody in the minority talking about how important it was to retain arts funding. Um, you, you see that pushback, Coming off the Repu well, Lance Pruitt talked about the university, how important it was to to to, to drag out the university uh, cuts and to, and to re re reduce the university cuts. We were talking during the break, uh, you know, about changing some of the legislature, but even uh, I think Brad was making a valid point that even uh, with some of the folks we had in there, some of the reasons why some of these vetoes went back in and were reversed is because the governor didn't have enough support on some of these things to uh, to override his veto um, or to protect his veto from being overridden and uh, I think that's a I think that's a valid point that you probably should repeat real quick Brad well when you when you look at uh, the Juno Empire has a has a yesterday's Juno Empire or today's Juno Empire has a great story uh, re looking at the governor's vetoes and it's got um, and, and, and the things he accepted and it's got a quote by Lance Pruitt uh, toward the end, uh, that, that's very revealing. Uh, the quote basically is, yeah, we talked the governor into restoring some of these cuts. Um, and Lance talks about uh, senior benefits, as, as Shelley Hughes talked about in her Facebook posts. Uh, Lance talks about the university, that, that he's pleased to see the governor restore the university and to, and to put the, governor, the university on a, on a softer slide. 
uh, Colleen Sullivan and, and Lance talk, talk about uh, senior benefits, restoring senior benefits. It's um, and somewhere in the mix, somebody in the Rep Republican minority must have pushed on the Arts Council because what the governor did with these vetoes uh, was say, OK, can I get 16 to support me continuing 16 legislators who will support me? Uh, on a veto override in these areas. And basically what you see in the areas that the governor didn't veto again, where the governor accepted uh, the legislature's uh, restoration of funds, those are areas where you didn't have 16 votes. So it's not, it's not, just, it's not just electing a, a, a stronger Republican legislature. Uh, I think we have to face the fact that even among Republicans, there's, there's a baseline of spending that they're not willing to go below. Um, and that baseline of spending, I mean, the, the, we were talking about it earlier, earlier that, that the, 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 the end result of the vetoes is about $4.2 billion. Of spending. That baseline of spending is not down to the level of revenues, uh, the level of revenues that we have. It's, it, we have a deficit. So I think we need to face up to the fact that even if we elected a new Republican legislature and even if they were, they were all strong Republicans, all like the minority, that's not that's not the total solution, because even there you find you find the Republicans uh, drawing lines and saying, oh, no, we don't want to go below that level. Too much government dependence, I think, is is probably part of the problem here. Greg, Greg says something like I can't believe how dependent we become as citizens on the government. And I would agree with that, even at every level, like you said, even people who are supposedly conservative Republicans who are saying, well, you know, cut that program. But my God, don't cut my program, because that's an important part of what we my community does. And I think that's you get 40 or 50 or 60 people all saying that all of a sudden you've got 60 extra pet project programs at millions of dollars apiece that uh, end up costing us in the long run. Yeah. And, and, and the one that shocks me, I mean, the, the, the poster child for this is the Arts Council. I again, I've got friends uh I've got good friends in the arts in the arts uh segment of of Alaska. They've been pushing to restore those funds. I've been pushing back saying, "Look, we all have to chip in. We all we we can't have these free goods anymore. All have these free goods." And and then the governor goes and restores the Arts Council funding. That means somewhere in the Republican minority there was a block that 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 he wasn't he wasn't certain he could get to 16 uh, to prevent uh, a veto override on on that area, so right. yeah, that's sort of the poster child. If we can't get there. I mean, I used to say, and, and I will still say, if we can't cut the university, we can't cut anything. Well, if we can't cut the arts council, we certainly can't. Right, can't exactly. Cut, can't cut a lot of things. Uh, a lot of folks here in the chat room, uh, Brad, and I've seen two or three people say that they're mad enough to sign the recall. And in and, and I mean, I'll just I'll throw my two cents in just to, for what it's worth to say. I think that that's. That's foolish from my perspective, simply because he's done everything that he can do. He's still fighting it. Um, uh, but, it, you know, it doesn't doesn't make sense to throw the baby out with the bathwater at this point, uh, because, I mean, what would have your alternatives? What would your, your alternatives been at this point if he hadn't been in there and if he doesn't continue to fight for these smaller budgets? Oh, I, I mean that that's just that's that's the height of silliness to, to say that they're gonna sign sign the recall and they want the governor to be recalled. We do understand who succeeds Dunleavy, right? It's Kevin Meyer. And we do understand that Kevin Meyer voted for every PFD cut <laughs> that, right. that he could while he was in the legislature, and he voted for every spending bill he could right. while he was in the legislature. So I mean that's just if we don't have Dunleavy at the top, if we if we replace Dunleavy with Meyer, we're just dead. I mean, the tax bill isn't. We're not going to be covering a nine hundred million dollar deficit. We're going to be covering a billion and a half deficit, and 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 the PFD is going to be gone. The PFD is going to be the first thing, first thing to go. Um, so it's not. I mean, you're 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 committing suicide, really. If you're a conservative and you believe in small government, and you believe in cutting cutting spending, you're committing suicide uh, by uh, by pushing for. Uh, the governor call. So that's uh, that's number one. Brad did a little analysis there. Let's uh, let's open up the ball on number two here before we have to go to break. There are a lot of people out there who are claiming that government spending is really what's driving the economy, and we need that, and we need to do it, and we need to keep it up. And but we just shouldn't all have to pay for it. Just you know, the lowest income earners and everybody <laughs> else should have to pay for it. Well, that, the last part they don't say. I mean, uh, there has been on on Twitter, in the in the in in news in newspaper articles, 
in op-ed pages. There's just been representative, Democrat representative after Democrat representative saying um, uh, the, the, the governor needs to restore this spending. The governor needs to, to, to you know, restore senior benefits. Andy Story has a representative. Andy Story from uh, from Juno has a op-ed in uh, in the weekend's uh, Anchorage Daily News that says budget is an investment, spending is an investment in Alaska. We need to spend. What all of these representatives, Zach Fields, Andy Josephson, Andy Story, Ivy Sponholtz, as they as they go through and they say, oh, we need to restore spending. What they're not saying is, oh, by the way, and we support restoring spending by pushing the cost down. On, on, on middle income and lower income Alaska families and not uh, uh, assessing the top 20% or non-residents to help pay for it. And certainly what they're not saying is 80% of the legislature, including them, including Zach Fields, Andy, Andy Story, Andy Josephson, and Ivy Sponholz, including them, are in that top 20% and, and are, not being, are not being tagged with any significant costs uh, to, uh, to to support this this increased spending that they want to do. So basically, it's let's spend more, but I don't want to pay for it. So let's push these costs off on on middle and lower income Alaska families. And I think that's that's one of the one of the biggest hypocritical things uh, that I've heard um, certainly in this past legislative session, but certainly in, in in a lot of legislative sessions, even counting a lot of legislative 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 sessions before this it's it's let's spend more but don't tax me let's tax middle and lower income alaska families to do it and i just that that's that to me is sort of outrageous right that 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 they're not willing that these representatives these people who are pushing additional spending they're not willing to step up and pay a proportionate part of it they just want everybody else uh to pay for for the spending that, that that they want to take credit for. Brad Keithley is our guest, the uh, director and founder of Alaska's for Sustainable Budget. We're going to be back with him here in just a moment. Let's uh, finish up real quick with number two, the, the phraseology of investment. Budget is an investment in Alaska, uh, is, the, is what Andy Story said in her piece. And I just got to say that is a, uh, you know, that kind of that kind of phraseology is part of the problem. Um, you know, we it is not a government doesn't invest. Government is a net consumer. It does not produce wealth. And I think that's part of the problem with some of this uh, philosophy is that they believe that that's the only way that society can move forward is with the direct benevolent intervention of government. Yep, certainly right. But again, Michael. I mean, it's not only the Democrats. My problem with the Democrats and my problem to some degree with the Republicans is is they want to spend, but they don't want to pay for it. Again, 80 percent of the legislature is in the top 20. And what they're doing is pushing the costs of, of this spending of this investment down to the middle and lower income Alaska families. They're 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 talking a good getting a good game, but they're not living up uh, by by paying for where their mouth is going. But but this 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 concept, I, I, again, just to go where we were a moment ago. This concept of government is an investment, government is good, government is it, – it, it's not only the Democrats, it's not only the moderate Republicans, but when you get down into the – when, when you see these veto restorations um, uh, or the, the, the absence of a veto on these, on these second things like the Arts Council, you got, you got Republicans even in the Republican minority who are saying something like that. Right. They're saying go yep. government is good to, to spend on these areas. Let's uh, quickly take up number three. We got about four and a half, five minutes here. Number three is this discussion on a tax. Uh, of course, there was a piece in the uh, ADN, an opinion piece says, "Tax me, please." But they called for a progressive income tax instead of a flat tax because uh, they said that a flat tax was too regressive, was too uh, inequitable uh, on this. And and I again, um, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Well. <laughs> That that was an interesting piece. I mean, basically, we're, we're we finally have people saying, "Oh, I recognize that I've got a piece of this. I've got, I've got to pay for a piece of this." And that's that's really what we need a lot of people to realize, and then say, "Am I willing to pay for this, or am I willing to to take spending cuts?" This particular piece on the progressive income tax goes way the heck too far. Basically, uh, at the end of that proposal, it's let's have a progressive income tax. And let's base it on federal tax payments. So let's 
do a surcharge on the federal tax payments, uh, which would would for a state income tax, which would then make the state income tax progressive. Let's do a surcharge on the federal income tax and raise the money necessary to uh, to to cover the deficit uh, off of uh, off of uh, high income uh, players. We th- this is this this is an article that, that by somebody who hasn't done work on what the tax base is of, ver- of these various alternatives. Alaska total, all Alaskans pay about $3.7 billion annually in tax, federal income taxes. That's all out of a, out of a $25, $27 billion uh, uh, income economy, uh, we pay about $3.7 billion in taxes. The surcharge to raise a billion dollars um, the surcharge on the federal income tax payments to raise a billion dollars in revenue would have to be 30%. Right. So you'd have to pay 30% of your uh, of your of your federal income tax as a state income tax to raise that billion dollars. A flat tax, on the other hand, is is to raise a billion dollars is four percent. So we've got we've got people who are who are who are talking starting to talk about various revenue options, but without really thinking through or doing the research or doing the numbers about what it means uh, for those for those revenue options. Other people talk, for example, about, well, let's just base, let's have a, let's have a tax based on, on federal taxable income, not the tax you pay, but on, but on taxable income. Well, taxable income is only about $20 billion. So to raise a billion dollars uh, off that twenty billion dollars, you'd need about a five percent, uh, a five percent uh, tax rate uh, on on taxable income. Again, a flat tax based on adjusted gross income, uh, uh, applicable to all Alaskans and non-residents, uh, to raise a billion dollars is only about four percent. So, as we get into this discussion, it's good to get into the discussion. We, as 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 you and I have talked about before, and as we've talked about today. At a $900 million deficit, we need to be having the discussion about revenues. When you look at the number of people that are in the state of Alaska, uh, you know, 700,000 with really about you know 300,000 employed, 200, 250 to 300,000 employed, um, you know, is there, I mean, could we even raise enough revenue to fill this $900 million gap? That's part of the problem. Oh, I mean, you you can raise it through PFD cuts. You you can raise nine hundred million dollars through a four percent flat tax, and I think the economy would be fine. Uh, would adjust to a four percent flat tax and 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 go on and be fine. And that would do is give everybody skin in the game, and then all of a sudden people would focus on spending instead of instead of give me government. It would be oh my gosh, I can't. I mean, four percent is way too high. Let's do this spending day. You would you would flip the incentive. I think that's I think that's tolerable, uh, but but Kevin Meyer, I mean Kevin Meyer will spend to the six, the one point nine billion dollars of PFDs uh, without even even breathing hard. So it's um uh, that, that's just that's just foolish to 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 push for the recall of Governor Dunleavy. I know a lot of folks in the chat room right now are saying you know that we're talking you know that we're pushing too much on the taxes. We're pushing too much on the taxes. We're becoming. We, I used to like you, but you're becoming a tax man. I mean, that's the wrong answer. The problem is, is that we live in a we live in a fiscal we live in a reality. I have my ideals too. I don't want taxes, but if they're going to control the discussion and they're going to keep doing what they're doing, and people say, "Well, I know, but we'll we'll get them out of there." But we've been saying that for 20 years. We've been saying that I've been saying on this program for 20 years that we don't have a revenue problem we have a spending problem they have continued to quote it as a revenue problem and they've now framed it to the point to where it is the reality we just we you know unless we replaced it less you know uh, uh the bubonic plague wiped out the entire legislature at once and we and we went in there and and replaced everybody with somebody who was of like mind the chances of getting this in there in this you know in this decade are getting slimmer and slimmer. Yeah, I don't think I don't think legislators, move, particularly since eighty percent of them are in the top twenty percent, and they're able to slide these costs, the remaining eighty percent. I don't think legislators wake up to this fact until they and their donors have to confront the fact that they're going to have to pay taxes if we don't get spending down. 
until we get until we put that sword over their heads they are not going to confront this issue they're going to continue to push costs on middle and lower push costs off on middle and lower income alaska families and the only way you're going to create that sword the only way you're going to put that sword over their head is to say okay you want to quit you want to continue spending then we're going to have to pay for it here's the tax bill uh, to pay for it once we do that and once they confront that we'll start getting spending down but this sort of doing it in the abstract while they've got the option of, of pushing the costs off on middle and lower income alaska families it, it's not working it's, it, it, it didn't work before. We put a governor in there who, who, whose every breath was to try to accomplish it. He hasn't accomplished it. We got a Republican minority in there that's even pushing back uh, on, on vetoes. It's not working. We've got to do something different to make it work, and that is to put the tax sword dangling over everybody's head if they continue spending. Catherine seems to get uh, the point to say at some point in the future, we will be taxed, not if, but when it's wise to set a structure now to support something we can afford to pay. And I agree with that. And if we need to come back later on after a flat tax or something is enacted and then people get their head in the game and we get the cuts, then it, it could be reduced to almost nothing. I mean, that's that's the whole point here is that until people have skin in the game, that's the only way we're going to be able to get it done. We've got about 60 right. seconds here, Brent. Right, and, and 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 as long as they can slide those costs off on middle and lower income Alaskas through 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 PFD cuts, they will continue to do it. We need to change that dynamic. We need to we need to make the legislators in their donor class confront the fact that they're going to have to pay taxes if they're going to continue down this road. It's the only way we're going to get it solved. Yep, it's the only way to put the, have make sure everybody's got skin in the game, and we could see, um, you know, we could see the the handwriting on the wall. Um, all right. Um, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. And thank you for coming in, as always, and uh, joining us this week. Michael, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.